Welcome to Advanced Java Programming at Portland State University. In this screencast, we're going to conclude our discussion of the core APIs that are available with the Java Programming Platform. We're going to focus on type safe enumerations, discuss system properties, and then uh, spend a little bit of time talking about how Java works with dates and times. So, type safe enumerations. Um, some of you might be familiar with the uh, enum from uh, in, in C. The whole idea is that you've got uh, a whole bunch of the same things. Think um, uh, colors, you know, okay, so we've got a whole bunch of colors, right? Red, blue, and green. Or um, uh, suits and decks of cards, uh, aces, spades, clubs, diamonds, stuff like that. Well, Java 5 introduced um, an enum facility to Java. It's a lot like a class. As a matter of fact, underneath the covers, it is implemented as a class. Um, but uh, this class has a set of predefined constant instances. Um, so you only have uh, a handful of these instances, a handful of instances of this class. Um, and uh, you, you treat uh, an enum very much like a class. You can import it. Um, you can reference uh, its predefined instances using static import. However, unlike a static final field, you can have a reference uh, to an enum and uh, sort of the information about that enum, maybe enum, its, its name and things like that, won't be compiled into the class. So I don't know if we've covered this yet, but fields that are final, uh, particularly static final fields, um, are treated specially by the Java compiler. So let's say you've got a static, uh, a final field, something like pi, it represents a constant, right? 3.1415, blah, 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 blah. Um, if you reference that constant in your program, so uh, you know, you're computing the, the, the radius of something and you're using pi in, in, a, uh, in, in an expression, the Java compiler, um, instead of, and this is part of the language, instead of uh, referencing that field pi at runtime, it'll take the value of that field and inline it into your um, expression. Um, and as a result, if you go and change the value of pi, maybe you add more digits of precision to it or something, if you change the value of that pi constant, you'll need to um, go back and recompile all of the uses of that, uh, of that constant. So all the code that uses that constant will need to be recompiled because the value is inlined by the compiler. Java enums don't have this problem. Um, the enum is, is referenced at, uh, at runtime. And um, I think the, the original intent behind letting the language or letting the compiler inline constants was that it was seen to be faster. These days, field accesses are um, so, so fast, and the, uh, and the, the just-in-time JIT compiler that uh, operates inside the VM um, it will do all this inlining analysis anyway, that, that is really not needed. Anyway, that's just a, um, a difference between um, using uh, static fields, uh, or sorry, using constants and, uh, and using enums. Anyway, uh, back to these enums. Um, so the, the enums, here again, they are they're essentially objects. Um, they're obvious with a special syntax. Um, and uh, out of the box, enums have useful toString equals and hash code methods. Um, so if you go and just, you know, you have an enum and you print it out, it gets a, it's toString is, uh, is basically the, the name of that, uh, um, name of that constant, name of that uh, enum instance. We'll see an example here in a moment. And it also um, implements equals and hash code, which allows them to be used nicely with collections and things like that. Now, um, enums, enums are classes. And uh, so you can add um, you can add additional implement uh, interfaces onto them. So you can add behavior to your uh, enums. Um, they also implement the serializable and comparable interfaces. We talked about comparable already. We haven't talked about serializable. Uh, we might get to that in, in a later lecture. But if you're familiar with um, serializable, all enums are serializable. You can also use enums in a switch statement, which is something that you can't do with just any old object. Um, you can do it with numbers, um, and in Java 7 you can do it with strings. Um, and, and really what enums give you is compile time safety for your enumerated types, which means that your constants are no longer just ints. Um, there are some older APIs in Java that have um, enums which are essentially numbers, right? You have sort of like magic values for um, things like, uh, oh, I don't know, you know, here again, um, the suits and decks of cards, or um, there are some things in the the AWT 
um, layouts to talk about, well, I want to put something in the north part of a panel, and that north is a number, like four. And that's not type safe, right? Um, you could uh, you know, find yourself passing um, that same constant off to some off to any old method that, that it takes an int. Um, and it really doesn't help with documentation. So anyway, um, because you have these enums, you get compile time um, safety for, uh, for your enumerated types. Okay, what does all of this look like? Here, here's an example of a new. Here I have a class, and inside that class I declare um, an enum called day, and there are seven values of that day enum: Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And um, if I go and just like you know, print out one of these things, I'll get capital Sunday as its value. But here I have a, a static method called en español uh, that will convert uh, the day to um, its string in Spanish, its string value in Spanish. So I switch on the day, and uh, I have a case for every value of that enumeration. Um, and then I just, to be safe, if I you know get down here, um, I have a, uh, well, I have a num value that I, I don't know about. So I'm going to throw an exception there. Um, again, the nice thing is that this is all um, strongly typed to the day. It's not like I'm passing in, you know, an integer value for that. So here again, it looks, you know, a lot like enums in, in C. Here's another example of that. I'm going to create a uh, sorted set, tree set in this case. I'm going to put three of the enums in there, uh, Wednesday, Monday, and Friday. It's a sorted set, and because all enums implement the comparable interface, they will compare themselves based on the order in which they're declared in, uh, in, in the source code. So when um, this enum is compiled uh, into a, a, a Java class underneath the covers, each, each one of these enums gets a, an ordinal value starting with zero, and in this case ending with six, and that ordinal value is what's used by the implementation of the compare to method to compare one, um, one day to another. So I'm going to print them out, uh, sorted, and then for each one I'm going to print out the, uh, the result of en espanol, and when I run this, I see that they're sorted in the order that I expect, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, right? I added them in one order, but I got them out in their sorted order. Um, and here again, I'm invoking the two string on the, uh, on the day object. And the two string of the day object is just the, uh, well, the, the name of that value as declared here um, in the source code. Again, um, this really, this enum construct is just syntactic sugar over, you know, creating a class with, you know, particular, in, with, you know, only seven instances of it. And then here we are can, um, translated into Espanol without uh, accents and stuff like that. So lunes, miércoles, viernes. As I said, underneath the covers, enums are compiled into uh, classes, inner classes in this case. We'll talk about inner classes in a different lecture. Um, for what it's worth, uh, all of the classes have a superclass of Java Lang enum, which provides methods uh, like equals the hash code and the ordinal. R really, uh, there here again. There's a lot of sort of magic syntactic sugar here. The only uh, method that you uh, you know that, that that the enum class itself has to provide is two string, and the, uh, the sort of the generated class, the enum class, also has a couple of interesting static methods that you can work with. So values will return an array of each of the uh, enumeration instances, each of the values of the uh, of the enumeration here, and then value of will convert a string. To a uh, to, to an enumerated instance of that given name. So here I can go find oh you'll find me the enum name dime, um, and uh, this would be you know nice if you read it from a configuration file or something like that. Um, here again, uh, this is just a, a nice language feature um, that allows you to uh, have uh, strongly typed enumerated um, values in your Java programs. So you can also add um, more behavior to enumerated types. As I said, they can implement um, interfaces. And uh, you can also um, you can also declare um, additional methods on the uh, on the enum. So, for instance, here I have uh, enumerated types of various uh, numeric operations, and the syntax is, is a little weird because you have to declare the instances before you declared the um, the methods after them. So, skipping down here to the bottom, what I've done is I've added an eval method to each operation instance and a get symbol method to the uh, to the instance. And um, I have to declare them as abstract because I don't have, the, I don't implement the, well, actually I could, I think I could um, provide implementations here. In this case, I want each 
um, operation type to specify how it evals two doubles and what its symbol is. And so the way I do that is with this syntax here. Um, so I have a, a plus and I begin a block here. I'm going to uh, then implement the, uh, the two methods here. And this will look a lot more familiar once we talk about inner classes. Uh, here the implementation of eval for plus is x plus y and its symbol is going to be plus. I've, I've compacted the syntax to fit on the page. Similarly for minus, um, the implementation of its eval method is going to be x minus y and its symbol is going to be minus. So now um, I've also got times and divide which weren't on that slide. Um, and so now I, I can do something like the following. Um, I can uh, make my uh, array of ops. Actually I could have just done operation.values I guess. Um, and then I can iterate over that array and then apply each operation to the values 5 and 2. So I'm going to say 5, you know, plus, minus, whatever, 2 equals the result of that operation. And see, well, now when you run it, uh, you go through each one of the uh, enumerated types, it prints out 5 and whatever its symbol is, 2 equals, and then the um, evaluation of, of 5 and 2. So you know, 5 plus 2, 5 minus 2, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So anyway, so um, another neat thing about enumerated types is that you can add behavior to it. Okay, one more uh, collection class that I want to talk about is Java Util Properties. Um, properties is an object that maps strings to strings. They're basically like a, a map, um, but the keys and values are all strings. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure it implements the, the map interface. And what properties objects are most often used for is to store some configuration information about your application or about the JVM itself. And it has methods like um, set property and, and get property. It also has the ability to um, write the contents of itself out to some print stream um, and then read it back in. So you've got you know load and store. And this is nice when you've got you know a configuration file with just key value pairs in it. You know the Java Util Properties object works really really well like that. Oh yeah, again um, the properties object does implement the map interface, um, but uh, it doesn't implement everything exactly the way it expects. So for instance, um, the put method um, does not uh, for, again for backwards compatibility, the put method uh, does not uh, force you to uh, give uh, to, to provide string keys and values um, so you can you know put an integer in there you can put an object in there you can put you know whatever in there it'll do it without complaining that's just the way it behaves okay like I was saying there is a special instance of properties um, known as the system properties and these are properties about the JVM itself um, there are a whole bunch of built-in properties but you can set your own properties with a dash D option capital D option to Java um, and those of you who are familiar with uh, C or C++ may recall that if you send dash capital D to the uh, to the C compiler, that will set uh, a pound define um, for the, the preprocessor. System properties are sort of the closest thing that uh, you've got to a pound define uh, in, in Java. Um, I guess the, the difference, the biggest difference being is that it's not a compile time thing, it's a runtime thing. So how do you get these system properties at runtime? It's, it's possible that your program might want to load some configuration from one of these system properties. Um, there is a uh, there's a method, static method on the system class called get properties that will return the entire properties instant. Or if you just want to get an individual property, you can call system.getProperty. Um, note also that the wrapper classes um, have uh, these static methods that begin with get, things like integer.getInteger and boolean.getBoolean that will uh, read the value of a system property as a string and uh, return it as a as the appropriate a primitive type. So if you say, you know, integer dot get integer and pass the string port and then you have a system property called um, port set, um, it will uh, read the value of that system property and convert it to a uh, can convert it to an int. If the uh, value of the system property is malformed. Um, it'll do whatever you know integer parse integer uh, does. It throws number format exception or something like that. Okay, let's see these system properties in action. Here I have a, a little program uh, that does the following. First, it goes and gets all of the system properties uh, that are set, and it'll print it out to print it out to, to system .out, standard out. Then it's going to check to see whether or not a particular system property, in this case edu pdxcs 10 jdebug is set. And the way it does this is it uses the boolean.getBoolean API, 
it says, hey, uh, you know, get me the value of this system property as a Boolean, and then it'll print whether or not uh, we're debugging. So now, let's run this program. Um, you know what, I think I'm just going to go over to the, the terminal and run it live here. So I'm going to set the value of the uh, oops, cs 410 jdebug equals true. I'm going to set that system property on the command line. Um, and then I'm going to put the class path on there. And then uh, the name of the uh, core.system properties. I'm going to pipe it into less so then we can scroll through it. Okay, so here we are. Um, and look at all the stuff that is uh, available as system properties. Um, you even something like go for proxy set equals false. What do you do? Um, but it gives you all sorts of information. Um, you know the, the name of of the runtime, who the uh, the vendor was. This is a JVM that comes from Oracle. How to contact them. Um, this is interesting, uh, the path.separator. So do you remember when we were talking about files and there were those two static fields in file, a file in the file in the job.io file class, um, the path separator and the, uh, and the file separator? Well, it turns out that those, uh, the, the values that are platform dependent are defined as system properties. So when the JVM boots up, part of the bootstrap process of the VM is to set the value of this path.separator system property to whatever the appropriate value is. On my Macintosh, it's a colon. If I ran it on uh, Windows, it would be semicolon. Would it be semicolon? I can't remember whatever it is. Anyway, uh, and, and so then the... Uh, Java.io file class um, reads the uh, the value of this system property to determine what the value of that static field should be. Let's see here. What else do we have here? Well, we have some interesting information such as um, the uh, the user.dir, which is the the directory in which the um, the the program was run. Uh, the value of the line separator for this particular platform. The um, oh the version uh, of uh, the, the class file version that's supported the version of the uh, the OS ah the location of my home directory all sorts of good stuff there there's my username that's gone through there oh and look at this here's the system property that we defined on the um, on the command line edu pdx cs four ten j dot debug dot true isn't it interesting the order in which these things are coming out as a uh, the the properties object is essentially a, uh, a hash table, and so the order in which the um, key value pairs come out is completely undefined. Anyway, you can run the program and look at all of this neat stuff yourself. Um, but the uh, the important thing to note is that okay, up here we've printed out all of the key value pairs in that properties object, and then when we asked are we debugging, we said yes because the value of that um, of this system property that we defined up here is true. So I, I hope you can imagine how you might use system properties um, in your program. Um, it, it's good for you know passing in can, uh, configuration on the command line. Okay, uh, we're going to conclude with a discussion of, um, of, of date and time handling in Java. So there's a class called Java Util Date. And uh, really all a date is is a date and time, and it's, a, it's basically a time stamp. It's, it's a point in time um, represented as a number of milliseconds since midnight on January 1st, 1970, also known as the epoch or epoch. A date has uh, the ability to compare itself to another date, to determine if one date occurs before or after. And you can also get that um, number of milliseconds um, as, as a long using the get time method. If you create a date instance with the zero argument constructor, it'll uh, represent the current date and time. And so um, the date class, uh, that's all it does. It just represents a point in time, this number of milliseconds uh, since uh, January 1st, 1970. Um, it's really quite technical. And uh, it doesn't um, answer questions like, well, what day of the week is it? Or what year is it? Instead, 
that uh, that behavior, that ability, um, is uh, is it resides with other classes. So in order to support internationalization and multiple you know daytime formats, there are classes like Java Util Calendar and Java Text Date Format that um, have the logic, have the responsibility of of uh, formatting. And, uh, formatting days and times, dates and times, and also figuring out like what calendar system you're using, because there are different calendar systems out there. Um, I've got a class called uh, Around the World, which um, shows off some of the different um, uh, date formatting uh, functionality in Java. And you know what? Let's just take a minute and uh, run this Around the World program, um, so that we can see, uh, so that we can see some of uh, Java's uh, facilities for um, for formatting dates, times, and other things um, for various uh, various languages and countries, so-called locales. So EDUPDX CS410J core around the world. Okay, so uh, this prints the the current time, uh, date, and time. I also print a number, currency, and a, and a percentage. And what I can do is it's got options like country. Um, let's have a, a country be the uh, the UK and language be uh, English. Okay, uh, here it is. Um, looks uh, pretty much the same. Um, let's just do something a little bit more drastic. Like uh, country France, language France. Aha! Look at all this different stuff. You have a uh, different day of the week. You have a different month. Um, they, uh, the, you know, the, the time is uh, printed for, uh, differently. Similarly, look at the difference in how numbers are formatted. So instead of commas to separate uh, thousands, there's a space, and uh, instead of a decimal point, there's a, a comma. Um, percents look about the same. Let's see if uh, what happens if I try to do like uh, China language Chinese. Okay, interestingly enough, it doesn't uh, have uh, Chinese characters, but the currency um, is certainly different. Um, well, let's see here. Well, you know, you can have uh, lots of fun playing with different uh, you know country and language uh, combinations. Um, but anyway, so that's 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 basically what is possible, and what makes it possible is the fact that uh, it, Java separates out the logic for formatting dates and for understanding the calendaring, cal calendaring system from the uh, Java Util Date class. Okay, Java Util Calendar. So a, a calendar is used to get information about a date. So things like you know the day of the week or the month of the year, um, stuff like that. And so a calendar represents a calendaring system. And there might be multiple, well, actually, no, there are multiple cal calendaring systems um, out there. Uh, the API that, that it has, um, I got to admit, is a little clunky. Um, it, it was funny that we just talked all about um, enumerated types and how great they are and how you don't need to use um, these, you know, uh, constant int fields anymore. Well, the calendaring class predates uh having enums in the language, and so it still uses this old pattern of um, uh, integer constants, in constants for, uh, for various fields. But anyway, you can ask for things like the day of the month, day of the year, which year it is, information about time, such as the hour, minute, and second. The, uh, the, the calendar instance itself, you can set the time, uh, you know, the date, um, that's associated with the calendar, and so you, you know, get one of these calendar instances, and you say, here's the date that I want information about. Um, and then you can, you know, do things like, hey, use the get method to ask for, hey, what day of the month is it? Or um, if you want to um, uh, increment or decrement um, one of the fields, uh, it has support for that too. So if you want to find out, okay, what's the date going to be in 30 days or in one month or um, in, you know, 472,000 seconds, you would use the calendar object uh, for this. And so, um, you know, all these operations, well, all these operations have a lot of logic behind them. And all that logic, instead of trying to cram it into the date object, is separated out into this calendaring object. And so it's the, it's the you know, code that's responsible for understanding about leap years and leap seconds and, um, you know, er everything like that. 
So if you look at the API documentation for the calendar class, you'll notice that all the constructors are protected. Well, if they're protected and it's in the Java Util package, how is your code that's not in the Java Util package going to be able to access them? Well, the calendar class uses um, a design pattern called a factory method um, to, to get at instances of it. So you don't create instances directly. Um, instead, you uh, call a static get instance method to uh, return a calendar instance. And the reason that it does this is that the get instance method will create um, a, uh, a calendar instance which is configured to run on your system. So, well, you know what, I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, first, let's take a look at the, uh, the calendar API to see how you use it. So here is a, a, a program that prints out information about the current date and time. So what does it do? Well, first it creates uh, a new date with, uh, zero, with zero arguments in the constructor, which will create a date that represents right now. It'll get a calendar instance, and it'll set the time of that calendar for, for right now. And then we use the, the, the get API to interrogate that, that date. So it's like, hey, calendar, give me the day of the week. Give me the day of the year. Give me what week of the month it's in. And then, whew, we have a really hard to read, um, big concatenated string that prints out all sorts of stuff. So it'll print out the two string value of the date object. It'll print out how many milliseconds has been since the epoch. It'll print out which day of the week it is and which uh, day of the year it is and which week of the month that we're in. It's kind of hard to read, but all that gets uh, plunked into a big string buffer and printed out. And what do you get? So then it looks like this. So I guess I last ran this in 2005. Oops, been a while. Um, but uh, it was a Thursday, apparently. So when you um, print out the two string of, a, of the date object, this is what you get, sort of a, uh, you know, a, an old style Unix formatting, Thursday, uh, July 28th, blah, 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 at that, that time. That's how many milliseconds it's been since the epoch. Um, it was the fifth day of the week. It was a Thursday, 209th day of the year take his word for it, and we're in the fifth week of the month. And all that information was available for the, uh, for the calendar class. It's okay, so why is this interesting? Well, um, it's, it's another good example of separation of responsibilities, separation of duties among different objects. So the representation of a date, sort of like the point in time, that's the date object. That's all it's uh, responsible for. The, the logic for how it's accessed, how it's worked with, um, what the, the date sort of means, the calendar system, is in a different object called a calendar. Um, this makes uh, the time facility much more modular. It allows you to support different calendaring systems, right? There's a Gregorian calendar, there's a Hebrew calendar, there's a Chinese calendar. You can invent a Martian calendar, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and the way you do this is by implementing a different calendar class. You would have to go through and... Um, and, and change the date class, which of course you couldn't, right? Because that was a, uh, a standard, um, you know, this, that was Sun's class, or rather that's Oracle's class now, and, and they can't change it. So back to the to the get instance method. The, the whole reason that um, the calendar is hidden behind a get instance method, uh, the creation of a calendar um, is hit, hidden behind a get instance method, is so that the uh, the JVM can uh, make a determination at runtime what the proper calendaring system is. So we, you know, run um, our program in the in the Western world, and it returns instance of a Gregorian calendar. Our code doesn't know that because it programs to the calendar interface. Right? Our code doesn't really care which calendaring system is used, or what the name of the month is, or you know how many days there are in a given month, or what year um, on the calendar it is. It just knows that it asks the appropriate calendar object, hey, you know, tell me what year it is. So you can imagine that if we ran um, our, our program in a different locale, let's say, I don't know, you run it in Israel and, and the computer's configured to use the Hebrew calendar, which is a little unlikely, but you can imagine how it works, um, that uh, when you ask it the year, it would tell you a completely different year. But your program doesn't care, because it was programmed to the interface. And so uh, it went and got the calendar object that was appropriate for its, uh, for its particular invocation and worked with that. Okay, so calendar is all about describing the date. Uh, date format is used to uh, take a date and turn it into a string using the format method, um, and then vice versa, convert a string, you know, parse a string um, into a date. Date format has uh, four sort of built-in formats um, that, uh, 
that are determined here again the, by uh, by the locale. So so where you're running. So uh, if you run it on a uh, you know on, on a US based machine, um, date format dot for short or will refer to a date format instance that will format and parse a date that looks something like you know six slash seventeen slash ninety four nine thirty seven p.m. Medium gives you a little bit more detail. Long gives you even more detail, and then full gives you a whole bunch of detail, including you know the uh, which day it is, the uh, you know full time, and also what what time zone you're in, stuff like that. Um, again, because these uh, because the date format it depends on what locale you're running in. Um, the, uh, the one way to get a date format, or, or rather, the way you get these date formats is using these these factory methods. So, if you want a date format that just formats and parses time, call get time instance. If you want to just for, one that just formats dates, um, call get date instance. If you want to want one that does both, call get date time instance. And these methods will put together the appropriate date format object for you. There is one um, instance method. On the uh, the date format, which is interesting, which is set lenient, which determines how strict parsing should be. So, should there be a little bit of fudge factor um, in your parsing? So, for instance, you know, if you, um, oh, I don't know what a good example would be. Um, if let's say you're using date format short, well, should it accept uh, six seventeen ninety four? But should in addition to zero six seventeen ninety four? You know, things like that. Um, I, I'm guessing that uh, you know, for most of the parsing, we won't want lenient parsing. We'll want um, well-formed parsing. So you'll probably be setting lenient to false. Okay, here's an example of working with date format. We're basically going to take all the command line arguments, um, glue them together, um, uh, parse uh, that as a, uh, a date, and then also format it. In several different formats, so we'll parse it as date format medium. And the way we do that is say date format dot get date time instance with a, both a medium format for the date and the time. Then we will parse uh, the value of our two string, calling trim to trim off the leading and trailing white space, if any. Um, and then parse it. If you can't parse it um, for uh, whatever reason, uh, it'll throw a parse exception, and we can uh, you know we can print out information about that. But once we parse it, we've parsed it. We've got a date, and then we're going to format in format in various ways. So first, we're going to format using the short format, the medium short format, long format, and then full format. And sure, certainly enough, when you or rather sure enough, when you run this program with a date like uh, June seventeenth, nineteen ninety four, at nine thirty seven forty five p.m., you'll see that that date is uh, formatted um, in 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 various different ways. Okay, so that's date format. That is uh, good for sort of the if you want to use one of these uh, built-in formats, one of those you know short, medium, long, full formats. Um, if you want more flexibility, um, there is a subclass of date format called simple date format. It's really not all that simple, but it's certainly flexible. Um, basically, what it does is it's a lot like um, oh, whatever the C function is. You know the thing that lets you format times. Um, it, you, you give a format string, um, and you give it a date. Well, you give it, you give it a format string. We create the simple date format, and that's the format that'll be used to uh, parse and um, format your um, uh, strings. And it's got all these symbols. Um, I'll let you pause the recording and uh, and and go through them yourselves. But the, you know, needless to say, you've got a whole bunch of symbols that represent various things about that date, various properties of the of the date being formatted or parsed. Um, including if you want to have uh, escape text in there, you can do it that way. Here's uh, an example of using date format. Um, basically, it's a command line program where the first argument is the format to um, uh, well to use to format, and it will print out the current date using that format. So when I go and run this program, and I give it like this big ugly um, uh, format string. It'll print out. Uh, you know, a short day, uh, what month, what what year? Oh, sorry, the the the, the month and day, the epoch and the uh, the time zone. If you want uh, a more uh, verbose format, if you want a, a longer description of your uh, name and things like that, you can add. Um, you, know, you just have the symbol occur more times 
in the string. So instead of just saying one e, if you say multiple e's and multiple uh, years and multiple uh, time zones, and I'm sure most of you are z right about now, uh, you get a, a longer string, like, you know, Sunday, the whole word Sunday, the whole you know, four-digit year 2001, and a big, long Pacific Daylight Time. So, uh, again, the lesson here is that we've separated out how a date is presented, how it's formatted, how it's, how it's parsed from the date itself, right? We've got a date format object, and what date format is really good is it formatting dates. It doesn't know how to store a date or whatever. We leave that off to the um, the, the, the date class. It makes, keeps the date really simple and puts all the logic in something else. And because we have um, the, uh, the date format class, you can... Uh, display and parse dates using uh, uh, in, in a variety of, of different ways, or rather using a variety of different formats. In particular, you want to display the date differently and parse the date differently based on the locale that you're running in. So a locale is a language country combination. Um, so you can imagine um, that, uh, well, I mean, let's, let's consider a, a bilingual nation, something like Canada, that has both you know, English and French um, speaking populations. Um, you can, uh, you know, so if you're running your, uh, uh, if you're running your program in British Columbia, for instance, which is mainly English speaking, um, your program will format dates and times uh, using Canadian English. But if you run it in Quebec, uh, it'll uh, it'll format it in uh, Canadian French. Um, and, and so then this gives you a, a lot of flexibility, and, and really it, it gives your users. Um, a familiar experience, right? I mean, it's sort of like, I'm sure you've had the experience where you've you know, used some piece of software or looked at a, a website that was hosted out of a, a foreign country and maybe it formats things in a way that looks different. And, uh, you know, we're also wanting to figure out what they mean, but it just kind of makes you scratch your head for a second. Well, you don't want to have your users scratch your head. That makes your software look bad. And so because Java abstracts out the the, the way dates are uh, are are formatted and parsed, um, it allows you to have a more native feeling uh, to your application, and ultimately this is this is a good thing. I'm going to take a detour through another language feature, variable length argument lists. Um, okay, so we saw that uh, Java 5 introduced enums, just like C. Well, it also introduced um, a variable uh, length argument list, vargs. Um, to uh, to methods. So you know, you guys remember printf in C, where it's like you know the first argument is a uh, a format string, and then you have zero or many um, other uh, other arguments to it. And if you ever looked at how that's implemented, it's kind of crazy. But anyway, um, there's something uh, very similar um, in in Java. Now, before this feature, um, if you wanted to have arguments that you know took multiple um, arguments, you had to overload it. And there are some APIs that will, uh, you know, take one string and then, you know, same method is overloaded to have two strings and three strings, blah, 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 blah. Um, or you had to pass an array and the language syntax for that was awkward. Well, now there's a special key to keyword, which is three dots and ellipses, that indicates that you've got multiple arguments to your method. The, the the ellipses is basically syntactic sugar over an array. At, at the end of the day, the compiler turns it into uh, you know an array creation, and an array is passed uh, to your method. Um, and as a result, the um, you can treat that uh, variable length argument as an array. You can ask it for its length, its zero index. You can you know, give the zeroth element. You can iterate it over it in an enhanced for loop. All that good stuff. Note, though, that a method can only have one variable uh, length argument in its list, um, oh, variable length argument, um, and it must be the, uh, the last argument to it. You can't have it in the middle, you can't have it at the beginning. Um, so, for instance, there is a uh, static method in the arrays class called asList that takes variable length arguments. So I want to create an array with, you know, three strings. I want to create with five strings. It's all the same method. It's just called with variable number of variable number of arguments. So here's an example of that uh, so we can see what it looks like. Um, I have a, a function method called uh, print sum. The, uh, the first argument is a string which is the header to be printed and then uh, it takes a variable length um, number, a variable number of int arguments that are the ints to be summed. So what do we do? Well, we uh, iterate over that uh, that those arguments, basically an array, 
um, and compute the sum and then print the header and then print the sum. So notice how this method is invoked. Right? We're calling it three times here and the first time okay, we're spending it a, uh, you know, a string header with the values one, two, three. We're calling it again, now we're sending it five ints. Now we're sending it four ints. So the whole idea here is that you've got um, you know, the last argument in the, uh, in, in the method call um, has, well, multiple arguments. And you know, at, it's, uh, at, at runtime, it really passes an array. But it looks like at compile time that you're sending in multiple, uh, multiple arguments. So why is this interesting and why are we talking about it now? Well, they leverage this feature to um, introduce um, printf style formatting um, in, uh, in, in, in Java 5. Um, and this made text formatting much nicer and, and much more like people coming from the C world had expect. Um, yeah, not the place with Shamu, the people that programmed in C. Just want to clarify that. Before, um, before the, these formatting, um, the, these nice formatting features, uh, you, you had to build up big strings with string builder dot append, or you had to like invoke print multiple times and things like that. Um, th they did have a message format um, uh, class, but they had like it was kind of awkward to use. Blah, blah blah blah. Well, they made things a lot simpler um, by leveraging variable length arguments, and so basically now. Um, print stream was augmented to have a printf method, which is just like printf and C, in that uh, you you know the first argument is a uh, uh, is a format string, and then you've got a variable uh, list of arguments that are well the data to be formatted by that format string. Um, and uh, it's it's got some. Uh, improvements over C in that there is a uh, better um, runtime type safety um, of these things. So um, not only can you um, format you know, primitive types, but you can also uh, nicely format you know, strings, calendars, you know, everything else. Um, if you want sprintf like functionality, which is basically formatting to a string, so not printing it out someplace, but formatting to a string, there's string.format, which here again takes a, a format string and a variable length of arguments. Uh, again, um, there is runtime type safety in the formatting. So if you tell it to, you can't tell Java, or rather, Java won't let you um, at runtime format a calendar instance as an int. Right? This is something that you can do in C. You know, it, it, it's C. Everything's a void pointer, right? And just casts. And okay, it, it tries it, its best. Well, Java says, hey, you know, you're, we we there's no we, we don't know how to take a calendar format it as an int. We're not going to try to guess. We're not going to print out some pointer or its hash code or something like that. We're just going to throw out an exception. And ultimately, at the end of the day, that's the behavior that you want. Okay. What does the uh, str uh, the, the format string look like? Um, it looks a lot like it does in C. It starts with a percent. Um, and then you've got stuff like you can have uh, an argument, which is the, the index of the argument in the, very, you know, in the var args list. You can have flags that uh, modify the, the output format. You can have the width of it, so it's like the minimum number of characters that should be written for the arguments. So this allows you to have um, columns of data uh, and things like that. Um, if you uh, are formatting a number, you can have a, a dot precision. Uh, here again, a lot like uh, C, where you can say, you know, percent %f 2.3 for, uh, well, 2.3. You probably say, you know, 5.3 to have something of width 5 and um, with three digits of, uh, of precision. Oh, I haven't got to use the word mantissa yet. Anyway, um, and then uh, all those are optional, but what's required after the percent sign is, of course, conversion character. This is your percent %d, your percent %f, your percent %whatever. Um, here are all of the various conversion characters. Um, it's a little richer than what you have in C, but it looks a lot like it. Um, so you've got, you know, old friends like percent uh, D and C. You've got new friends like percent %s for string it will invoke the two string of the object, um, or percent %h for the hash code um, of the object. You have uh, a couple more options for floating point. Then that's in you know that's in canRC. Um, you have uh, options for formatting times, which we'll see uh, in a little bit. And if you want to have a new line in your string, you can just say percent %n. Again, uh, there's uh, good support for formatting times. 
So if you want to format time, uh, like, of course, our old friend Posic Sturf Time, because um, apparently in C they couldn't afford vowels, um, you can say things like percent %t capital H for the hour of the day, or uh, percent %t uh, big M for the, the minute, 00 to 59, um, stuff like that. So actually, this is a nice alternative to that symbol date format, which I'm pretty sure is leverage underneath the covers, to... Um, to format your uh, your date and times, again you can have uh, percent t's for uh, these um, characters to uh, to format dates, um, and uh, you can have these flags uh, associated with any string that gets formatted. So you can have it left justified. You can, um, if you're formatting numbers, you can say you can use the plus flag to um, always have a, a plus or minus sign for uh, for numbers. Um, and you can also say, you know, zero pad, hey, I want to have um, grouping separators, negative numbers, percent parentheses, everything like that. So actually, it's it's very powerful um, string formatting. And, and this is nice because, uh, you know, there were a bunch of COBOL programmers that were used to, uh, you know, having all of this stuff for writing their fancy text-based reports that got printed out in green bar impact paper and anyway. Um, uh, and, and, and But they couldn't do this in Java. And people complained, and the uh, Java guy said, "Okay, yeah, you're right. We can do it. We can do it in a pretty nice way. We need to, you know, leverage la new language features like variable args, but we can do it." And they did. So anyway, here is uh, an example of using these uh, format statements. Um, we're just going to print out, you know, a bunch of various formatted strings using the printf method of uh, of print stream. Um, and so we have things like here's, you know, printing out a formatted string. Hello world. So you the format is uh, percent f's percent n. We'll print out information about uh, a date and time. So we're going to get uh, a calendar object. I'm pretty sure this also works with a date object. Well, um, actually, maybe not. It probably do it probably doesn't work with a date because it wouldn't necessarily know um, which calendar to use. But don't quote me on that. You can try it yourself. Um, so we can, uh, you know, uh, format the, the date as the, the month, date, and year. Um, it's kind of awkward that you need to pass in the today three times, but not a big deal. Um, the same thing for the uh, the hour, minute, and uh, and second. That's what that is. Here's how you format numbers. Looks a lot like um, it does in uh, in in C, uh, where you know percent f to uh, have a floating point. Uh, percent dot two f will be a floating point with two um, uh, di two decimal digits after it. And then it'll print, uh, you know, here again, another floating point, which is the um, quotient of, of those two numbers. Um, here's an example of, um, of, of having column-based, uh, uh, or, you know, columns of width 5. So it's going to print these um, values as strings that are each in uh, a, a, character, a column that's five characters wide. And then this will print left justified and, uh, and right justified code. Okay, now I'll take a look and, uh, and run this program. Java-C clean. Classes on there. EPXCS410. J, J2, SC15. Formatting. Okay, here we go. Yep, it prints uh, hello world, which is our format string. There's the, uh, the date and time. Here is the current time. There is our uh, formatted um, floating point numbers. As you can see, by default, there appear to be six characters of, of decimal. Here we only have two. Here is uh, our uh, strings that are formatted with a uh, with each character is in a five, or each, each number is in a uh, column which is five characters long. And here's some uh, left justified uh, text, and here's some right justified text. So all good stuff. Okay, and we're finally at the end. So this concludes our discussion of those core um, APIs that are part of the Java programming platform. So as you can see, we've uh, talked about a really uh, a wide array of, of, of functionality here. Things like uh, classes that support the language, string, string builder, um, the class class, we'll dive more into that later. The wrapper classes, or Java line integers, or Java line doubles, also good stuff like that. And the math class for uh, supporting, well, math operations. We saw how to work with I.O. 
um, doing both byte-based and character-based I.O. So we saw the file class, and we saw the readers and writers, and the input and output streams. We also talked about uh, a number of uh, handy utility classes, things like the date and calendar, and how it's interesting and important to note that the date class itself, the functionality is very limited because other things that you'd want to do with a date, like you know, figure out what day of the week it is or uh, uh, format it as a string, those are responsibilities of other classes. Um, and, and by doing so, um, you're, you uh, provide a lot of flexibility with, uh, with the API. And we also dove into details about the, uh, the collections classes. We looked at uh, old collections like Vector, and uh, then we looked at the newer collections APIs, uh, things like the list and inter iterator, the list and iterator interfaces, um, and also implementations like HashMap. And we saw how to compare objects with comparable, comparator and comparable. So that's all for now. Um, as always, thanks for listening to the screencast for Advanced Java Programming at Portland State University.